to get through. So generative AI and language models, um, one of the first things to say is that it's moving very rapidly. There are new tools, uh, new technologies, uh, new concerns arising almost every day. So the first thing I want to do is just to give a, uh, an overview of where we are, particularly around ChatGPT4, which is the, uh, the best known and still um, the largest scale model. So ChatGPT version four, it's a highly trained conversational agent, text completer style copier. It can now generate up to 25,000 words. So that's a, an entire dissertation. It can write in any style in multiple languages. It can be given a direct instruction, such as explain string theory in 200 words for an 11 year old child. It can interpret text and images. So on the right hand side of my slide, you can see uh, a uh, exam question in French, uh, although the prompt is in English, with an illustration. And it can interpret not only the text, but also the illustration to answer that question. It's a general purpose language tool. And even more recently, uh, there have been extensions to GPT, uh, Chat GPT Plus, and that has plugins for, uh, from third party companies for maths, for science, for language, business tools. For example, the Wolfram um, uh, mathematics uh, engine can now be linked into Chat GPT. And importantly, it now has integration with a web browser, so you can ask it for up to date information. And yesterday I uh, asked it which tech companies are likely to perform well in the near future. It went off and browsed sites relative to related to my question and synthesized the results and gave links to those sites that it had found. So it's up to date information and it has a code interpreter to run and display Python programs. And that may sound a bit geeky, but what it means is it can create pictures, it can create visualizations. For example, it can analyze a, a large database and show initial visualizations of that data. So it's a pretty powerful, not just language tool now, but connected into database uh, and other tools. But as we've all heard, generative AI hallucinates. It doesn't know that it shouldn't, for example, invent research studies. It has no internal explicit model of how the world works. It has um, emergent properties. It acts as if it can do maths, for example. It acts as if it has a, a model of the mind, but it has no explicit inspectable model of the world. And in human terms, it's amoral. Uh, it is neither, in a deep sense, it's neither careful nor caring. It's a language machine, not a database or a reasoning system. Now, <clears throat> over the last few months, I've tried uh, a test with it. I asked it to write a student essay. And the way that you prompt it is important. So my prompt, you're a student on a Master of Education course, write a high quality 500 word essay on a critique of learning styles. The essay should include academic references and evidence from research studies. It should begin, the construct of learning styles is problematic because. And I gave um, that prompt and it produced a response. Um, in November, 2022, when ChatGPT first came out, that was the first response it produced. So it looks like an academic uh, student essay. It has references, uh, it has a reference to research studies. And most of it is accurate, but right in the middle of it, there is a sentence there. Um, and that sentence referencing a research study is entirely invented. And it also, to back that up, produces an entirely fake academic paper. Why does it do that? because it's a language system, it's a language generator, not a database. However, when I gave the same prompt to GPT-4 in March 2023, it was much better. 
it produced a set of references, all of them accurate, all of them correct, and a, an essay that I would have been happy that a student submitted. So the one thing I do want to emphasize, if people say GPT can't do this, you need to ask them which version of GPT, because GPT-4 is a great deal more effective now than GPT-3 or 3.5. So how should institutions react? They could ban um, these models, but the problem is that will open up a new digital divide between confident students who will continue to use AI and will challenge decisions based on uh, attempts to detect whether they um, are using AI tools or not. And less confident students will be turned off using any sort of AI assistance, such as machine translation or style checkers. You could evade it, but invigilated exams are costly and limited. And asking students to state when they use AI will become increasingly difficult because these tools will be embedded into general office tools, such as Microsoft Office. We could adapt. But that requires new methods of assessment, new policies and guidelines. And certainly in the UK and I think across Europe, uh, now institutions are looking to adapt rather than to ban or evade. And of course, you could embrace, as for example, the country Singapore has done, uh, you could embrace AI, but that involves a long process of building trust. But for the for the last few minutes, I want to try and flip the narrative away from how will AI impact education towards what are new and effective ways to teach and learn with AI? I'm just giving you a few examples. So these are possible, these are example roles for generative AI. One is as a possibility engine. So the educator or the student uses AI to try and answer a an open question by generating multiple responses to that question. And then the student individually or in groups synthesizes and critiques the AI responses to produce their own written answer. Another role for uh, generative AI is as a Socratic opponent in an individual or a group activity, students engage in a dialogue with uh, chat GPT or another language model, and then each student writes a, an essay based on that discussion or argumentation. Another one is as a personal tutor, where students have a tutorial assistant for any topic. And uh, uh, AI, one of the great goals of AI has been to create a intelligent tutoring system. We now have a tutoring system that can tutor on any topic. And as uh, an example, I asked it to tutor me in quantum computing and it did a good job. Uh, it firstly tested my current understanding and then it took me through a tutorial discussion. It also, if I asked it to go into further detail, it did. Uh, and also it took up an analogy that I used. So it doesn't just go through a preset sequence of tutoring. And then I asked it at the end to uh, summarize my current knowledge, my current understanding. So it also can act as a dynamic assessor. That's a very quick whip through the possibilities for new roles for generative AI in education. Uh, and here are a few more of them as a study buddy, as a motivator, um, as an exploratorium, as a co-designer. But I want to say that we should use generative AI with care. As I said earlier on, generative AI is fundamentally careless and uncaring. And we need, as educators, to add that care in terms of how we deploy it. We need to rethink written assessment. We need to still be aware of AI for factual writing and to uh, check and evaluate its output. We need to explore AI as a tool for creativity, argumentation and research. We desperately need to develop a new AI literacy and to introduce and negotiate guidelines and policy for students and staff. And just to finish off, um, 
what comes next? So there's a lot of obviously publicity about chat GPT and GPT-4. They are not the only language models. Uh, and there are some very interesting uh, and uh, quite uh, exciting possibilities coming along. So there's Microsoft Copilot, which means that generative AI will be integrated into the office suite. So it's moving from a model to part of a tool set. Google Bard, so Google now has responded to ChatGPT with its own language model called Google Bard that has been trained in a, in a bit of a different way. It's been given pre-training on how to respond appropriately and ethically. It's multimedia, uh, it's uh, multiple language, and it has topic specific tuning for business, for medicine. But also worth mentioning are some of the more ethical based uh, language models. So there's Claude from a startup company called Anthropic that has been trained explicitly on what it calls constitutional AI. It's trained on specific ethical principles to be helpful, honest, and harmless. And Bloom, which is an open science, open access language model um, that has been uh, trained on uh, a supercomputer in France. Uh, and there's an opportunity, I think, for European institutions to get involved in training these new open models and also in fine tuning them towards specific topics and in determining responsible, ethical, effective deployment in digital education. And the last one I might mention is what's called hybrid models. So it's combining the um, neural network type models along with symbolic AI so that you can set high level goals. Uh, for instance, design me a course on this topic and it will go away and create plans. It will create tasks. It will call in the right tools, for instance, for web design, and it has a long term memory. So it's uh, putting together generative uh, neural network AI with symbolic AI, and it's likely to be very powerful. Um, so there are a lot of issues and problems with these models, but also now a growing diversity of them and an opportunity to explore how they might be used in different sectors of digital education. And just to finish a few resources, um, I would mention the book from Rafael Perez Perez, myself, called Story Machines, How Computers Have Become Creative Writers which goes into the background and the history of uh, language generators. And a report that I would recommend very much is the UNESCO uh, Chat GPT and Artificial Intelligence in Higher Education Quick Start Guide. And it does what it says on the cover. It's a quick start guide for educators in uh, higher education. That's all I can get through in 10 minutes, and I hope it's been useful and will prompt a, a discussion over the next few minutes. Thank you so much. Mike, even we go a little bit further, we have a panel, so I want, want to ask the panel members to go up front. Uh, I will introduce you in a second. Mike, uh, in general, as the EFU board uh, for innovations and respond and critique, we use Mark Brown uh, as a, a sort of advanced organizer. But I can see now that ChatGPT will uh, put Mark Brown out of business. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, uh, these are serious times. Yeah, these are serious times. Uh, and also, you know, I would still emphasize that ChatGPT is only one of many different sorts of language models, uh, some of which are, you know, will be powerful in different ways. And I hope they will empower us rather than replace us. But that's um, to be discussed. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, so uh, the, the panel is uh, uh, up front now, and uh, I'm going to introduce Henrietta Cabonel from the Unity in uh, Swiss. Uh, Achilles uh, Kameas from the Hellenic Open University and Roland Lampke from the European University Bank in the Netherlands. Um, I want to ask you just uh, for a quick answer, a quick response uh, uh, on, on this, but you are going to moderate the session. So go ahead. <laughs> you can also. Yeah. Okay. 
I'll do it every time. Okay, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you, uh, Theo, for uh, okay. This is Alexandra <coughs> Finacci. Nice to meet you uh, online, Mike. Um, I'm from DDU and I'm uh, moderating this session. And I want to come back on your presentation, actually. You said uh, that we need to embrace the AI in education and ask ourselves what are um, new and effective ways to teach uh, uh, and learn with AI. And I would like to start with this, keep uh, with this. Uh, the, Panel session, maybe you could uh, uh, start the mic, this uh, is more continuous, and then uh, I have some questions also from uh, the panelists that will be introduced. Um, so, would you, uh, yeah, um, reflect on this? Maybe? So, new and effective ways to teach and learn with AI. I think we really need to start from good pedagogy. Uh, up till now, most of the discussion has been about the new technology. If we start from effective pedagogy. What are effective ways to teach, learn and assess? Uh, we have um, 30 or 40 years now of the science of learning. We know that rapid feedback, we know that collaborative learning, we know that project-based learning and problem-based learning are effective ways of teaching and learning. How can we then design uh, these new systems and fine tune these new systems to support that sort of learning. And I think it's an opportunity for those of us who come from a digital education background to try and lead that discussion about effective ways of teaching and learning and not just leave it up to the technologists to propose what type of technology is going to be put into schools and universities. That's very true, uh, but I want to reflect more on the data part. So it's true, it's not all about um, data. <laughs> uh, there are different perspectives in here. There is the teacher perspective, what they need to learn. And uh, we heard about uh, the digital skill, the student, what they need to learn. But um, I know Roland Clement has a very technical background and uh, does a lot of work with, in the Open University with uh, stuff related to artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, multimodal data. So what is your perspective in this and how can higher educational institution deal with it? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think one, one of the big problems that we have with the um, systems that are set out right now that are put in, into place like ChatGPT and like Google Bard and something is they are owned by commercial companies and they are closed. So we, as educators, we need systems that we can rely on when we want to educate with them. And that means we need to have a say in how these systems are designed and how, what kind of data they use, what kind of data they produce and how they are, they are put together. And with those commercial systems, we don't have that. Yeah, only the experts at OpenAI, a company, know how ChatGPT is, um, is designed, what kind of training data they used, how big the model is, and what technology they use. So on the one hand, I see a big, um, a big requirement towards <laughs> regulation. That is things that are already happening right now in the EU. How do we use these systems in AI? But on the other side, I also see that we as researchers and educators need to gain our own yeah, power in, in the use of these systems in terms of collaborating on um, open source systems, open access systems. And Mike has mentioned a few examples of, of these like Bloom and um, uh, Claude as, as models that are emerging, uh, that are also emerging partly from within Europe. There are further systems down the line that, that do this. And with these, we can have a strong, um, a strong position as European researchers also, or as researchers in general, on how these systems will be designed and how, the, uh, how they use the right data to, uh, that we need to, to make them usable in, within educational contexts and within <laughs> research. Hey, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ronald. So, but data with uh, learning, uh, larger learning, learn Oh, sorry. With the large learning model, it means language model, it means uh, pretty much text. So uh, we have uh, text, the uh, Mark also have uh, shown that. So this goes directly to 
the usage and um, the reliability, sorry, uh, reliability and accuracy of this text. So this text is pretty much used by uh, students, and I'm looking at Arietta, and maybe could enlighten us more on this aspect of reliability of the text and literacy of uh, students. What is your perspective? Is where the the place? Yeah. Well, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's a, an important one. That's the question you've just brought up of what, knowing what's in there, and um, as a educator, we need uh, the question of accuracy is particularly important. I feel, but this is um, the system as Mike mentioned is improving we we get it, it's getting more and more reliable but can a large language model and i'm really talking about large language models and not large language models and something else large language models guess the next word um should they be used in education to uh, um as tutors as in the it's the role of the teacher as a language model helping with writing helping with choice of words correcting writing translating Although translation is perhaps not right, the correct word, but all these things, it's very, it's very good at it, writes very well. But should we be using something that is just guessing the next word to help um, our students learn? They, we said it's not accurate. It's also not looking for the truth, whereas as a professor, we're looking for the truth. We're trying to work out what, uh, what is real, what is... Um, uh, what is our understanding of the world, uh, which the model is definitely not doing. It has no understanding of the world and it's not looking for that <clears throat> at all. It's not the objective of the model. Um, it's also uh, biased by the data. As you mentioned, we don't know what data went into it, but it definitely wasn't unbiased data. Um, so we're, we've fed it biased data. Biases are coming out. It's our biases, it's true, but as uh, university professors, is that what we want to share with our students? Um, what else? So, so, so there's a lot of elements. Uh, it chooses a word based on probabilities. It doesn't choose the word based on accuracy. So the, when I don't know how you work when you write, but it takes me hours to find exactly the word, right word. ChatGPT can help me find the right word, but I need to choose amongst different ones. And very often it's not the one that comes up first. And um, so all this means that it's um, questionable whether we should be using it as I, I, in my opinion, and in my understanding now, it might be possible to do other models. It might be possible to make it 100% correct. I know professors aren't 100% correct, but we're trying to get there. <coughs> ChatGPT isn't even trying. So with, even, with all these elements, I think it's, we need to think about how we want to use it very carefully, whether we want to use it um, to, as a tutor, or do we want to use it as other things? And we need this discussion because our students, at least we, did, we carried out a survey uh, in our university, and our students uh, responded that the first use, the current first use of ChatGPT for them is asking, getting answers to questions. So that's how they're using it at the moment. Um, they don't trust it completely, but um, that's how they use it. And if they don't know about the topic, what can they do? It's different if they're reviewing and questions like that. Thank you, Arietta. I think it might be that uh, also connecting with uh, what Roland said before, maybe we can teach the machine to learn more ethical approaches. I mean. Uh, we have seen what also Mike uh, said before that the, the LLM is improving. So we might be able, I'm not a technical person at all, but I suppose um, it's possible technically to teach this to the machine to be more accurate. We have seen it is accurate with the uh, resources. Maybe you could uh, learn more on uh, the ethical. But I'm more concerned about uh, the students and the teacher. And uh, I would like to hear again from Marietta, sorry, that this first I feel as, as you see me, but uh, more, um, I was uh, wondering on the skills that actually students will need to learn 
one of those is like uh, be able to understand that the LLM is not accurate. So you're reading something, not because the chat GPT is giving back to you is real. So one is that. And we heard from uh, uh, Mike um, also prompting, be able to put the right question is probably something they have to learn. But what else needs to be taught to them? I'll use uh, Mahara. Ma Sorry. I'll use Maha Bali's um, sentence. It's that she that she talks about critical AI skills, and I think we they really need to be critical in lots of dimensions. Critical in um, what comes out of uh, the the output generated by large language models. Critical. Uh, in a more interdisciplinary context, as, um, as uh, Mike uh, was mentioning, it really it touches on a lot of different aspects of um, society, economics, philosophy, uh, the epistemology, what is knowledge, uh, yeah. questions like that. So we need to be um, they need to be critical uh, in what it what AI is doing to society and what do we want it to do and what do we not want it to do and uh, <laughs> critical in pedagog uh, critical pedagogy sense that what is it doing to equality injustice is it recreating is it creating new injustices solving old ones uh, developing them just repeating them very often so all these aspects I think it's important for our students to learn to take a critical approach it should be AI rather than large language models because as we've mentioned before it's always it's <clears throat> sorry, changing fast we need to prepare them for a changing world they need to be able to think on their own uh, in the future and um, yeah I think and then for guidance probably from teachers yeah. for instance and also the last point is literacy <clears throat> it should be not only learning how to use AI it's pretty easy you type a question and you've got it prompting is very important as it has already been mentioned but also an understanding that you have to understand how the model works that's super difficult because most of us don't have the AI skills um, it's hidden a lot of the information is hidden I was looking at auto GPT trying to find information uh, about it uh, there's very little information out there um, so there's all that problem, but we need to know because a lot of people are saying that ChatGPT can do things that it just it can't do, yeah. at least on its own. And so we need to, to teach students that they need to understand what it can do to use it, to know when to use it, why to use it, how to use it, and when not to use it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And Lisa um, bringing me to the other side of the point that these are uh, teachers and I'm uh, looking at the um, Achilles uh, Kameas and uh, uh, at the Lenin University, I know you are doing a lot of uh, work also on policy level, institutional level, strategy. And um, I was wondering if you have a view on what are the soft and hard skills that the teacher will need to improve, despite that they are not the the only one that needs to learn about it. But how them can improve their skill, digital skill to embed artificial intelligence in their educational practice. Yes, uh, thank you, Alessandra. Uh, well, um, I, I, I will start from uh, Mike's presentation and this very nice slide with the four uh, stages like BAN, uh, adopt, embrace, and so on. Uh, I think BAN is not the, the way to go, as also Mike said, uh, uh, banning uh, the use of the new technology we tried this in the past at University of Actually, it's not only that students will go around it, but I mean, uh, an institution that bans the use of any new technology loses the opportunity, misses the opportunity to learn from this technology and learn how this technology can be contextualized in the specific context of the university, of the, university, of the institute. And then also, I think that uh, it's, a, it's rather selfish to ban the use of technology and wait for others to take the risk, others to, let's say, uh, make all the mistakes and then you will just, uh, you just profit for the mistakes. I think we should be all together in, in, in this. Uh, and it's, uh, well, we should all try to learn together. So that's some comments at the policy level. Uh, going now to the uh, teachers and educators. Um, 
Henriette already said that I do agree that, uh, uh, well, when Dr. Mike spoke about trust, but trust has two, two sides. Okay, it's we trust the system, but we have also trust ourselves that we can use the system in, in a proper way, in an efficient way, in a, I don't know, fair way. So, um, in order to build this trust, I think that, uh, well, now in the, let's say, hard skills of, of educators, we must add some AI basics uh, as we had to learn about, I don't know, online systems, uh, digital systems, and all of these uh, skills became, let's say, basic skills for, AI, for, for tutors, for teachers, for educators. Now, basics of AI will also join this, uh, be added to this group. Um, then uh, we need to see how uh, this, uh, the pedagogies, we, the, the pedagogical techniques we already know, uh, project-based learning, collaborative learning, uh, and other techniques, how will they change when this new technology will be introduced? And this will take some time. So I think that the first stage in all of this process is to experiment and learn and monitor and evaluate, collect enough data to see uh, what we can do at the same time, technology, of course, will this technology will evolve. So we need also to monitor the evolution of technology. I, I estimate that we're going to have a we are looking into a period of some years where technology will evolve, we will be training it, and then at some point there will be a, an equilibrium and we will feel it safe. And then uh, the soft skills, I well, uh, I think that we need to invest a lot in uh, collaboration to try to solve this, uh, to deal with this issue uh, all together collaboratively. Also uh, taking the initiative to change the ways we deliver education and uh, assessment also. Uh, I'm planning to do this in the next uh, couple of years. I'm planning to ask my students to deliberately use ChatGPT and see uh, how they come, how they deal with it and also myself learn from, from, their, uh, from their ways. Uh, Many thanks. I am uh, now, uh, I would like to involve the audience because I see some people are taking notes, some others are uh, looking at their computer. So, um, I might uh, require some attention a second. If we have uh, 10 minutes, so then we take a coffee. Um, I was wondering, just uh, random, who of you would uh, really feel threatened by the use of artificial intelligence uh, in the, their own institution? Yeah, if there is no right or wrong. Yeah, who feels uh, to say why? We are in panic. We're panicking uh, at the moment. In the, all, all, all Dutch universities are really panicking. Examination boards, they really don't know how to deal with classical, traditional, and old fashioned examination techniques. Yes. We still embrace and we still have. We don't know what new assessment techniques uh, are out there. We don't know how to deal with now uh, all these written reports and all these uh, uh, examinations from students, and uh, they are made with ChatGPT more and more. And we don't know how to, to uh, find out uh, the, the, what, what kind of way to go now. You can, because uh, so, some uh, professors say, well, we have to uh, do uh, this uh, face to face examinations again, but it's not possible because we have the number, is... number of students with hundreds in, in one module or so. We're in panic, panic. Because you cannot recognize if an essay is made up by the, the use of uh, LLM or the student. Don't. And I'm asking to the expert. I saw you a second as well. a second. I'm asking to the expert. Is there a way to recognize a generative text uh, right now? No, we are we are. <laughs> no, there isn't. <laughs> I have seen an uh, end from the back from uh, the colleague from Elenik. Forgot the name, sorry. Thank you, and I'm also from the Elenik Hoffman University as well. Um, in replying to your question, uh, is there a... could you turn on the mic for the audience in the is it, online? Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, there are two concerns that I have um, in response to your, your question. The first thing is that I feel that we are rather reactive rather than, than proactive. So we react to a situation which well, we don't know how to react. And um, it took us by surprise. And, well, it took me by surprise, all that. Uh, well, this year and last year. 
I didn't know before. So yes, I do feel a little bit better because you know I have to react to a situation which is developing and evolving, and I'm not part of it. I I, I don't in a way uh, I cannot well not control that you know I follow it. That's one thing. And the other thing, I think it's even more important for me. We heard before that um, they are is amoral. It may be the case that it could become immoral. So if um, particular sources of information are not there, they are excluded. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from the humanity, so we understand that for sure. If there are certain sources of information that are not there, then they are excluded. That's not amoral, it's immoral. So how do we deal with all that? So these are my basic you know, concerns. Yeah, we uh, Fernando. And uh, Ada, Ada first. Is no, no, first. Fernando. Fernando was first. Uh, can you hear me? Um, in my institution here in Spain, um, there is a sense of threat as well. Because using it properly, uh, might, might entail a change in the whole system, which is something that is a little frightening. <laughs> but, and also, it, there's also the, the feeling, the sense that students are way ahead of us. I mean, using them. And yeah. we are uh, training, uh, training the hard. And uh, well, that's not the, the feeling you want to have as a, as a teacher. One thing. Then, if, that's my comment. And then a, a, a question I, I, I have seen before that it was suggested as um, one of the possible uses of AI to, for example, make the students produce a, a text and then uh, comment on the text, criticize the text, and so on. But is that secondary exercise? Can the secondary exercise be done also by the AI? By the AI artificial intelligence? Is it capable of taking a text produced by another chat GPT and then, well, criticizing it, assessing it, commenting on it? From a gut feeling, that really implies that the AI could be critical, so I don't think so, but uh, I leave the floor to the expert. Uh, yes, certainly that is possible. You, if you can, if you can let the AI summarize um, yes. something and take a critical point or different point of view, you can also ask it to critically reflect on these three critical different points of view and summarize them again. So that's that's yes. fully possible yes. with the current versions of, yeah, of GPT. Yeah. <laughs> I was wrong, but I saw that there was other people wanted to talk. Was other Pastora? Other please. Um, <coughs> Mike, I think you are completely right that this is the end of the traditional assessment methods. We just have to take that serious. And this is a crisis because we haven't wanted to tackle with that question for years. <laughs> so now it's one more hit on this neural neurologic point. But I want also to stress the positive sides, you, you said about tutoring and dynamic assessors. Although I heard your critiques, maybe that's not the best tutor, but we all know we need more tutoring in large scales. We need more feedback mechanism. And my biggest hope with these systems is that maybe this is a way to do that with large cohorts. I mean, this one-to-one, -one Situation is a good one, and but we can't do it without machines. So could you uh, could you uh, underline that maybe the light at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> okay. Um, so I think there are many opportunities, particularly for um, personal tutoring, and that the students themselves are going to be you know, taking a lead in this. Uh, they just as they go to Wikipedia or they go to Google search um, to find information, to get up to date, to explore a new topic, they will be doing this in the future with language models. There will be problems um, with the responses. They will not always be accurate. 
Um, in the same way that Wikipedia in the early days wasn't accurate, and there was a lot of criticism about um, uh, encyclopedia that weren't human cu curated. But I, th I think as they start to improve, and particularly as they start to have back end tools like um, maths tools, science tools, they will become more hybrid systems that will be better adapted towards tutoring. So we uh, as I said before, we need to treat them with care and we need to develop an AI literacy in which students treat them with care. Um, they um, make sure that any evidence, uh, any information that comes from these systems are checked, checked against accurate sources. And that's part of a new AI literacy. But you know, I just want to end by saying that we can't sit back. Uh, particularly, we can't sit back and just let the, uh, the US corporations take a running in this. Uh, we have an opportunity to get involved in more ethical and more open language models, and also in adapting them to education. That's our, that's our expertise in what is good and effective education. And we have a voice in this. And I really don't want to just let the American technologists take a lead. Um, we in Europe and as educationalists, we need to take a lead in saying what is effective and ethical education. And that's the kind of message I would want to leave on. It's really nice. Let's be positive and not panicking and active and analyzing. And on this note, I have just the last question. And then we have the coffee from Pastora. This is where is yours. Okay, thank you. And it's more common than a question, but thank you very much. Oh, now? Now you can hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much for this panel. I will say it's more common than a question because I think this proactive way of dealing and talking with this panic attack we have right now is the way to, to address it. And, and at my institution, the Open University of Catalonia, we just started a structuring um, internal debate in order to bring all the professors together in order to learn because we should start learning ourselves how to deal with that how to understand it how to make it more ethical and more uh yeah everything that you was mentioning we are trying to do it at an institutional level so why not also at the network level we are here many of the open universities in europe trying to learn all together how to improve all these methods and how to avoid all these challenges and try to yeah. yeah, make them better. Yeah. yeah. So it seems a, a call to a dialogue, which is always nice, maybe a Socratic one with ChatGPT, who knows? Uh, so uh, I think it's time for coffee. Thank you, Mark, Mark, Mike, sorry, today, Roland and. Uh,